very much. Um, it is indeed a pleasure to be here. Um, in giving book talks around the country in the last six weeks or so since this book came out, um, I've encountered a lot of different audiences. And one of, the, uh, one of the questions that I get a lot of in college audiences is the question of how did you get started in this business? Um, and for those of you who are students, uh, who are maybe worried about the fact that you haven't yet picked your career, or you don't know what you want to do when you grow up, take heart. Um, <laughs> you never know when you turn the next corner what you're going to run into, and it can change your life and your career. And my story is a good example of that. Um, I was um, very aimless as an undergraduate student at UCLA. <laughs> I grew up here in Southern California. Um, I had, you know, passing grades, the okay grades, but certainly not very good grades for the first two years. I was uh, something of a jock. I played on the baseball team my first year, and then the second year I injured my shoulder, so I had nothing to fall back on athletically and had to start studying. Um, but it wasn't until my third year uh, that I had any cognizance or awareness at all of China. Um, Prior to that time, the only Confucian wisdom I had ever encountered was in the fortune cookies at Madame Wu's garden, <laughs> and in the uh, Saturday morning matinee uh, films featuring Fu Manchu and Charlie Chan. Uh, this was not a very rich background in which to dive into Chinese studies. Nonetheless, um, in my junior year at UCLA, I was a political science major because I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. Who knew? Um, I stumbled in, quite literally, stumbled into a Tuesday afternoon class on Chinese politics. The only reason I was there was it was the only political science class available on Tuesday afternoons, and I needed it to fill my schedule. Um, the professor was a crusty old geezer, a former Marine Corps colonel, um, and a real disciplinarian. And a lot of students had run, run in terror away from his classroom. But I frankly found him challenging, the fact that he didn't think any student could master the material in his course. And I just took that as a personal challenge. Um, it was the early 60s, I think it was 61, 1961, and China was just beginning to recover, in fact, just on the cusp of recovering from this horrendously destructive Great Leap Forward that Mao had introduced. Uh, there were lots of reports, rumors, hints of massive uh, uh, hunger and starvation, but not a whole lot of really good, hard information was coming out. China was surrounded by a bamboo curtain and very little uh, traceable information or verifiable information was coming out in those years. But my professor, H. Arthur Steiner at UCLA, used to come in every Tuesday armed with mimeographed sheets of um, translations from U.S. governmental publications uh, which talked about, uh, which were based on interviews with refugee informants in Hong Kong and elsewhere, and which gave really decent information about the magnitude and about the, the horrors of the famine. And I found it absolutely fascinating that um, not only that this massive country uh, could be in such a descending spiral of uh, hunger and uh, malnutrition, but that the leaders of the country, particularly Mao Zedong himself, uh, were pushing these programs that had led to this disastrous result with little apparent awareness or concern with the result, with the human cost. And I found that utterly fascinating, and it, it really was something that animated me for the next several years. Um, but when I went to grad school, I had no intention of being a sinologist. Um, it didn't seem like it was a, a really credible niche. Um, I, st I went to grad school as an international relations major at Berkeley, and it took me about one semester to realize that that wasn't for me, that I really didn't like it. And that semester was spent taking theory courses. And in the theory course at Berkeley, the first one I took, um, the entire semester was spent arguing the relative merits of the two prevailing theories of international relations, international politics. Realist theory or realpolitik and neoliberal international. 
And what were they? Realism said that countries pursue their interests. Uh, neoliberal internationalism said countries pursue their ideologies and values. And I thought this was just a stupid debate. Uh, I, you know, it's like the nature, nurture, heredity, environment argument in, you know, in sociobiology. And, and, you know, anybody who's got a thinking apparatus between their shoulders will realize that both things are involved. Now let's get on with it. Um, so I, I very quickly abandoned international relations as a field of study. But then I got quite depressed about what am I going to do next. Um, and um, I finally turned to my old professor, the Marine Corps Colonel, who, by the way, reluctantly gave me an A in that class. Uh, I really did beat him at his own game. Um, and I turned to him and I said, what should I do? And he suggested that I take a class up at Berkeley with uh, their leading specialist in East Asian uh, international and political studies, Robert A. Scalapino. And my first class with Bob Scalapino really, really changed a lot in my life. But we really hit it off, and uh, um, he inspired me with, uh, with his understanding of East Asian uh, cultures and politics and history. And from that point on, I just jumped into it uh, with both feet. It wasn't, it didn't hurt that Berkeley was one of 10 uh, academic centers that had just been uh, awarded uh, a major institutional grant from the Ford Foundation to study China. And so there was a brand new Center for Chinese Studies there with a mil million dollar endowment. A million dollars in those days went a lot farther than it does today. Uh, and so they had a lot of fellowships that they were opening up for students in uh, Chinese studies. And because the center was new and the, the fellowship program was new, there weren't all that many applicants. So I sort of, you know, just sort of lucked out in getting in uh, to this program in a year where there wasn't, where the competition was less than sterling. And for the next four years, um, my uh, graduate degree program training was funded by the Ford Foundation. Um, my, my dissertation project, which of course is the, the, the crowning achievement, supposedly, of your graduate career, um, was informed uh, while I was a graduate student by the fact that Berkeley had the world's best uh, training in theoretical sociology. Uh, the Berkeley Sociology Department in those days was second to none, with people like Reinhard Bendix and Seymour Martin Lipset and William Kornhauser, and just a whole lot of really world-class so, uh, sociologists uh, who weren't really interested in facts on the ground. They were more interested in spinning broad historical, theoretical uh, uh, abstractions. And my, my mind sort of went in that direction, too. Uh, I, didn't, I was not a narrow empiricist, which was a good thing because in those days China didn't have any statistics to speak of. Um, uh, it used to drive people crazy that you, you had to try to interpret what was going on in China without uh, any basis in data, or without very little, very thin basis in data, and a lot of speculation. Um, but in any event, I, I, when it came time to uh, uh, to uh, submit my dissertation proposal, um, I spun this elaborate theory of, uh, that was uh, intended to show decisively and definitively just why Mao Zedong's theory of permanent revolution uh, was bound to hit a stone wall when it came to time to uh, modernize and industrialize China. The incompatibility of Maoism and modernization was my thesis. And I took my inspiration from an article that some of you uh, older folks in the audience may remember, a piece that uh, Benjamin Schwartz wrote in the mid-60s on Maoism and modernization. Um, I was inspired by that, and so my dissertation was going to be a, an elaborate proof of that. But I had no idea how to prove it, particularly since you couldn't go to China in those days. Uh, the U.S. and China didn't recognize each other, so the closest I could get was Taiwan and Hong Kong. And so when I finished my dissertation proposal, and by the way, the reason I got to that stage without encountering anybody asking me, how are you going to do this, and <laughs> suggesting that maybe it's not possible to do this, um, my oral exam, my, the, the sort of last hurdle before you go off to the field to do your dissertation, uh, is a or university oral examination where you're supposed to defend your dissertation topic. Uh, and if there are problems with it, it's supposed to be pointed out to you. Well, my um, 
my dissertation defense took place in the mid-60s, in 1966 to be uh, precise, at a time when Berkeley was exploding in political, you know, factional, ideological conflicts. There was the war in Vietnam, there was the free speech movement, there was the Black Panther movement, and it was tearing Berkeley apart, ideologically and politically. Uh, to make matters worse, my own dissertation committee had on it representatives of both extreme wings of these political uh, polls. I had Chalmers Johnson on my committee, who in those days was a radical rightist defender of, of U.S. Uh, policy in Vietnam and radical opponent of the free speech movement. And, um, he was not a, uh, shall we say, a, uh, a gentle or sensitive human being. Uh, he had an opinion, he just, boom, laid it out there. So he was on my committee, along with Franz Sherman, a, a Berkeley sociologist, who was one of the leaders of the radical faculty uh, opposing the Vietnam War, supporting the free speech movement. And, um, you know, there's an old South Asian aphorism that when elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. And when I went into that oral examination, I was very <laughs> nervous about being the grass. Uh, well, the elephants fought. Franz Sherman and Chalmers Johnson spent two and a half hours just attacking each other, just trying to dismember each other. <laughs> and I sort of stepped back and never had to answer a single question. <laughs> and it was the easiest oral examination ever for a student. I could not have, have scripted it better. Um, so the good news was I passed with flying colors. The bad news was I still didn't know how I was going to write this dissertation. I mean, I hadn't a clue. Um, nonetheless, I had my ticket to the East, uh, uh, to the East Asia. Uh, the terms of my fellowship were such that I had to spend a year in Taiwan doing preliminary language study. They felt that my four years of study at Berkeley that wasn't going to prepare me uh, to de dig deeply into Chinese original resource mater research materials. So they wanted me to spend a year in Taiwan polishing up my Chinese. And then a second year in Hong Kong doing my actual research, which because I couldn't go to China would have to be documents uh, rather than uh, people. In any event, um, during this year in Taiwan, which was not a very happy year in my life, I, uh, I was newly married then and had an infant son. And as soon as we got to Taiwan, he became really ill with a parasitic intestinal infection that almost killed him. And uh, it was really a trying time for at least the, the first few months that we were there. Um, moreover, uh, my wife didn't want to be there in the first place. She was an English major, you know, uh, specializing in Shakespearean studies. But it, she really didn't want to be in Taiwan. And t Taiwan in those days uh, was not like Taiwan today. It was pretty much of a third world sump hole. Um, it, was, it was dirty, it was polluted, uh, it was a police state. It wasn't a very pleasant place to be in a, in a number of different uh, dimensions. Um, but I soldiered on and did my language studies and um, found that I, the more I, I engaged in this intensive, every day, full day uh, course of studying Chinese, the more I disliked it. Um, I never liked, enjoyed studying Chinese. I shouldn't tell my China colleagues here about this, but I never enjoyed it. For me, it was always like pulling teeth. Fortunately, I had a good enough ear for language that I could pick up the language uh, without, you know, having to really devote the, the, the kind of effort that a lot of people did. But my Chinese was never more than adequate. Um, but to relieve some of this tedium of, you know, water torture daily, hourly <laughs> memorization of characters, I used to spend my Friday afternoons um, in the uh, in a governmental think tank in Taipei called the Guoji and the International Relations Institute. And in that institute, they had a dirty books room. And the kind of dirty books they had weren't sexual pornography, but rather political porn. Um, these were mainland Chinese publications. Now, in those days, the government of Chiang Kai-shek on Taiwan was still at war with the government of Mao Zedong on the mainland. Um, and you couldn't, 
breathe, speak, talk about, or anything else, communism in Taiwan without bringing the full force of the authorities down on you. So they, they had this little room where scholars and other certified uh, uh, people who have a, a reason to be there can go and read mainland publications, People's Daily, Red Flag, Peking Review, things like that. And this was 1960, winter of 66, spring of 67. Um, and this was a time when the Cultural Revolution was, you know, causing all hell to, to come loose in China. Red Guards were, you know, attacking their teachers, attacking authorities. Uh, there was incipient anarchy on the mainland. And the only place you could read about that uh, was in the dirty books room in Taiwan, in Taipei. Well, I used to go there on Friday afternoons and uh, read the papers. One day, um, I uh, was chatting with the, the assistant librarian who was a Chinese from uh, Indonesia who spoke really good English. And he was moonlighting, lighting, uh, as a, an interpreter, a translator for the Guofangbu, the Ministry of National Defense of Taiwan. Now in those days, in the 60s, um, the Taiwanese were proving to be very valuable sources for stolen documents uh, from the mainland which their commando teams would, uh, they'd infiltrate the coast of Fujian province across the Taiwan Strait, steal stuff, and then come back to Taiwan and peddle that stuff to the United States. Uh, we got incredible numbers of valuable documents from these Taiwan, com Taiwanese commando teams and their guerrilla raids on the, on the Chinese coast. Uh, we got our first full story of the uh, magnitude and destructiveness of the Great Leap Forward from such a collection of documents. Uh, uh, a book was published called The People's Communes in Lianjiang, based entirely on these stolen documents. Well, David, my friend, at the, the librarian at the Institute of International Studies, was a guy who was translating these documents so they could be sold to the Americans. Um, and David had translated the Lianjiang documents, and one day on his desk as we chatted, I saw upside down as I'm standing in front of his desk, uh, a, a sheaf of documents that looked like they'd been dropped into the water, the ink was running, there was muddy stains on them, but the red stamps on the cover were what interested me. Mimi, secret, and a Zhongfa number, which is the official numbering sequence for Central Committee documents in China. So I saw those two red stamps on the front. And my friend David was, was just running off. He was, uh, he was very angry at the Ministry of National Defense. He said, those turtle eggs of Wang Badang, they, they think they can tell me to do something in two weeks and, I, and I'll just do it. Don't they know that I you know, have, a, have a life outside of their translations? And he was just very upset that they had given him two weeks to translate these documents. I didn't know how many there were. Um, I said, well, David, let me help you out. Uh, this is, you know, I'm studying Chinese, uh, this will be good for me, uh, I polish up my Chinese, it'll be good for you, you'll have time to do your other work. He said, I can't do that, if, they, if, they let, if I let this stuff out of my sight, they'll have my head. And I said, well, I'll do it right in front of you, I'll sit at the desk right in front of your desk, and uh, you can watch me, I won't take any notes, no copies, at the end of the day, I'll put everything back. Uh, where you want me to put it back, and you can inspect my briefcase, and, and that'll be that. And finally, I guess he just relented because of desperation, but he let me do this. And within a half an hour of the time I sat down to translate these documents, um, I realized that this was a gold mine. Um, these were documents from the so-called socialist education movement, also known as the Four Cleanups. Um, and this was the movement that commenced after the end of the Great Leap Forward in 1962 and terminated at the, on the, at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution 1966. <coughs> this was the bridge between Mao's two most destructive uh, mass movements, the Great Leap and the Cultural Revolution. And in these documents, which there were five of them all together, uh, from I guess the earliest was from the spring of 63 all the way down to the winter of 65. And they laid out in really interesting chronological fashion the disputes that were uh, emerging within the Communist Party leadership at the very top level uh, over strategy and tactics of revolution. How to revolutionize the country, how to mobilize the masses, how to recover from the damage of the Great Leap Forward. Uh, and it was quite evident that there were 
very serious differences of opinion being expressed in these documents. Uh, it turns out that the documents were, uh, had various different authors, which explains their different orientation. Um, but toward the end, it became clear, in the, by the third or and fourth of these documents, it became clear that Mao was becoming increasingly irritated at two of his lieutenants in particular, Liu Shaoqi, who was his number two in command, vice chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, and Deng Xiaoping, uh, who was the general secretary of the CCP at the time, and who, as you all know, uh, later became the paramount leader after Mao's death. But at the time, in the early 1960s, uh, Mao was becoming increasingly critical in these documents, uh, although they were very circuitous. They were never named by name. Uh, they would always use sobriquets, like some people in the uh, in the leading you know uh, leading ranks of the Central Committee, and things like this. You had to sort of know the context in order to know who was being talked about. Um, but Mao was very critical of Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping because he said, in his view, they had sold out the class struggle and were simply trying to regain economic uh, dynamic dynamism in the aftermath of the Great Leap Forward. Mao was very worried that capitalism was going to emerge in the aftermath of this destructive uh, so, uh, uh, Great Leap. Um, and he wanted the entire country to be put on alert to uh, safeguard against the capitalist restoration. Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping didn't worry much about that. They worried about restoring leadership, restoring organization, restoring morale, and most importantly, restoring production. Um, and these disputes kept getting stronger and stronger. And finally, by the fifth of these documents, Mao came right out and all but accused Liu Shaoqi of being a capitalist rotor, uh, hidden inside the ranks of the party. Um, and um, reference was made in this latter document to a meeting that had been held in December of 1964, at which Mao and Liu had actually gone at each other uh, quite angrily. Uh, the first evidence anybody had seen of such a meeting. In any event, um, I, as I read these and translated them, I increasingly felt um, both elated and frustrated because I was going to have to give them all back uh, and keep no records. Well, toward the end, in fact, the day before I finished my whole set of translations, I made a very fateful and blind uh, decision, spur of the moment. I couldn't let the documents go. So the night before I was to leave permanently, finally, um, I, shoved them in, I shoved the originals in my briefcase in a zippered compartment in my briefcase. And I put everything else back on the shelf as usual. And nobody was paying particular attention to me by this time. Uh, I showed the briefcase to, my, to the guard as usual and walked out shaking like a leaf. Uh, I jumped on my motorcycle and practically hit a pedestrian. I was so nervous. I was shaking, absolutely shaking. I couldn't even get the motorcycle started. I was so nervous. And there were only two choices for me then in terms of what, I, what was I going to do with them now that I had them. Um, in those days, they didn't have, you know, you couldn't go to Kinko's to copy documents. Um, there were two Verifax machines, which is a precursor to Xerox in Taipei that I knew of. There might have been more, but I knew of two. One was at the Taiwan National University where I was studying Chinese at the Stanford Center. And they kept their machine under lock and key. And I thought, oh my god, I'd have to break in uh, <laughs> to use that. And I thought I didn't want to do that at their top national university because uh, the dangers were <laughs> rather great. So the, my option number two was the American Naval Hospital uh, in downtown Taipei where I had gone to finally get my son treated, and they, so an American doctor I met there had actually uh, 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 introduced us to the doctors who saved my son's life. So I had had some interactions with them over the months, and uh, I went there knowing that they had a Verifax machine in their administrative office, and I also had a pretty good idea that their offices were pretty much deserted at night, except for one attending doctor who was on, uh, you know, emergency call for the American soldiers and sailors who were in Taipei. Uh, Thai so I went over there, and uh, sure enough, uh, a friend that I, of my of my doctor friend was there on duty that night, and we chatted for a while. I was waiting for an opening, uh, and then the opening came. Uh, a, a sailor came in having all kinds of DT. I don't know. He was having tremors, and he was. Uh, uh, 
Yeah, it turned out to be only the DTs, but at the time it looked like it was a seizure of the first magnitude. And so my doctor friend went off to give emergency treatment to this guy and I was left alone. So I ducked into the administrative office and for almost an hour and a half, maybe longer, maybe two hours, uh, I laboriously copied these documents one page at a time. Uh, it wasn't an automatic process, it was dry copy, so you didn't have to worry about things like mimeograph and stuff like that. But it was slow and tedious and sometimes you overexposed a page and sometimes you underexposed, so I had to do some of them over. But I got it, I did it, I, nobody was the wiser, and I got home before midnight. Um, still shaking like a leaf. And the next morning, um, <coughs> I cut my classes. It was the last day of classes at, at uh, Stanford Center, my language class. I cut it and went directly to the institute in the morning. Uh, I managed to come in at a time when everybody was coming in and I got the documents back on the shelf without anybody noticing it. Um, I got away with it. <laughs> Later that day, I said my goodbye, finished actually the last part of the translation, and uh, I said goodbye to my friend David Al and thanked him, he didn't know for what, <laughs> and he wished me well. And uh, within a few days, my family and I were uh, flew to Hong Kong for the second uh, year of our uh, uh, adventure. And in Hong Kong, I spent my time at the uh, University Service Center, which was, in the absence of, of, of access to China itself, was pretty much the next best thing. It was a fully equipped uh, research uh, uh, outfit that had offices for visiting scholars, it had a library, it had a real Xerox machine, um, it had all the, and plus they, they had rooms where you could interview Chinese refugees if you were doing research on contemporary China. It was a one-stop uh, sh uh, shopping place for all of the research on contemporary China. And uh, there were a lot of scholars there, and while I was there, the first, first in fact, the first day I was having lunch there, um, I met a young American researcher from Columbia University and we started chatting, and, and he, he told me that he had heard rumors that there was a treasure trove of documents that had just been uh, seized in Taiwan. Did I know anything about it? And I, I reached in my briefcase. Oh, you mean these? And that began a collaboration. The, the fellow who asked me about it, his name was Frederick Tevis, Fred Tevis and I, sat down and over the next six months we wrote up uh, all of our work. He had been doing research from newspapers, radio broadcasts, and had interviewed a few refugees in Hong Kong about the socialist education movement. Now I had all the documents. I had to retranslate them, of course, because I couldn't take my translations with me when I left. Um, but that was okay. It didn't, didn't slow me down too much. And so within six months we had um, done an analysis of the socialist education movement, uh, and we got a monograph, a, a small book, uh, accepted by the East Asian Institute of the University of California uh, to publish it, and then we had also written three or four articles uh, uh, based on that material. I mean, it really provided an enormous amount of material for me to write up and to, uh, to publish. Now, all of this time, I hadn't done a word on my dissertation. Not a word. Um, and I still didn't have any idea how I was going to do the dissertation. Um, but then I got some additional notoriety. It, it seems that even as, as we were churning out all these initial publications, it seems that the Taiwanese, and this, I think, was just fortuitous timing, uh, David had taken my translations, give them, given them to the Ministry of National Defense, and in the winter of 1967, uh, they decided, winter of 1968, excuse me, early 1968, um, the Institute of International Studies and the Ministry of National Defense sold those documents, my translations, mind you, to the U.S. government with a copy to the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. And the very first person to use these materials outside of myself was a CIA analyst by the name of Charles Neuhauser. And in, in early 1968, he published an article in the China Quarterly based on those documents, my translations of those documents, in which he sought to explicate the dynamics of Chinese interrelate politics in the early 1960s, uh, from the Cultural Revolution to the, uh, from the uh, greatly forward to the present, to the Cultural Revolution. 
And I read his, his article in the China Quarterly, and I thought, he's got it wrong. He just doesn't understand what these documents are telling him. Um, so being brash and, and rather fearless uh, at the time, no longer, uh, <laughs> I wrote a commentary to the China Quarterly in which I just basically very rudely trashed his interpretation. Uh, I, I implied that he hadn't read them thoroughly and that what he did read he misunderstood. And it, it was when I re, when I reread this as a as a quote adult, I sort of shivered at, at my uh, uh, at my lack of, of uh, manners in this. But anyway, I did write it. I was right, by the way, but it's the way I said it. <laughs> anyway, he wrote back and, and our our comments and his my comment and his rejoinder appeared in the same issue of the China Quarterly. And he was just as rude and nasty as I was <laughs> in refuting me. But what had happened was, and I had no idea about this at the time, within the intelligence community in Washington and Langley, Virginia, there was a raging dispute going on. There was a Team A and a Team B in the intelligence community. And Newhouser, the guy who had done this interpretation, was, I don't remember if he was A or B, but whichever one, he was on one extreme. And then there was another team of CIA analysts, led by a fellow named Philip Bridgham, uh, who was on the other, other team, who argued uh, the issues were mundane uh, and uh, really not to the outsider, terribly significant. But inside the intelligence community, they were really the stuff of factional struggles. And my commentary strongly supported, uh, indirectly, the Philip Bridgham faction. And they used that, among other things, uh, to cut the ground out from under Neuhauser, whose position uh, afterwards held very little credibility. And so Bridgham wrote me a note thanking me for taking down, that was his term, taking down Charlie Newhouse. I had no idea what I was getting into, but there it was. So I was a hero to a certain faction of intelligence theory and a, and a real you know, nasty piece of work to another faction. Um, but, but with all of this, with all of that publicity that came out of the, the documents and the, the books and articles and, the, uh, uh, and this commentary, uh, I was a hot property. I had never written a word of my dissertation. And I, started getting, I started getting job offers from American universities, Columbia, Michigan, UCLA. Even Berkeley was, was ready to hire me. Um, and I mean, what, what my decision was relatively easy at that point because one of the offers uh, included a letter from my former mentor, H. Arthur Steiner, the Marine Corps colonel, who said, I'm retiring next year, and I'd very much like to have you come and take my position. And I couldn't say no to that. I just couldn't. So I went off to UCLA. Uh, they gave me two years to finish my dissertation. <laughs> Little did they know that I hadn't even started. <laughs> um, but it's probably a good thing that, uh, in fact, undoubtedly a very good thing, that all of this other stuff intervened because I doubt if I ever could have written a dissertation that broad and that factless, devoid of empirical uh, testing. Um, but what I did do, because I was facing a two-year time limit, was rework all the material that I had gathered on the socialist education movement. And I went back to Hong Kong and I did additional interviewing and I read more documents and I was able to piece together a really comprehensive story of the movement. And I used that plus uh, an analysis of the early stages of the Cultural Revolution in the rural areas of China as my dissertation. And I barely made it under the, under the deadline. I filed my thesis a week before the, the uh, clock uh, was going to ring the alarm. Um, and to you students out there who are feeling like you don't quite know where you're going with your career and, and what's awaiting you and why don't I know, and why don't I have this burning feeling inside about what I'm going to do for the rest of my life, don't sweat it just yet. Um, there's lots of time for you to make the right decisions. And as often as not, as likely as not, those decisions will be the result not of agonizing thought and weighing heavy alternatives, but rather just some chance encounter with a class or with a document or stepping into the street at a, at a time when something is falling on the sidewalk next to you. Uh, chance plays a very big role in career choice.
Um, well, I could go on and on and on, but I think we're running out of time. So uh, I did, never even did get into, you know, the professional side of my career. Uh, there's lots of that in my book, by the way. Uh, and uh, right now, I'd just be happy to answer questions from, from you people. Thanks. And I'd be happy to sign it for you. <laughs> yes, hi. Did you use Macau as a window? Not really. Macau was a tougher nut to crack in those days. You could go to Macau, but very difficult to do anything there. Uh, no, it was all done in Hong Kong. It was all done in Hong Kong. Yeah. Did you find it was more difficult to analyze like Chinese events when there was no information coming out of China? Or now, when ah, very good question. Hundreds of articles every day. Very good question. Um, in those days, we really had to do seat of our seat of our pants analysis. We had documents. We had newspapers. A lot of newspapers from China. We had radio broadcasts, which were translated routinely by the BBC. Uh, uh, and we had a, a limited flow of refugees from South China, which whom we could interview uh, from time to time. But mainly, it was it was like having you know in, in most cases it was like having three or four or five pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and then having to interpolate the rest. And of course, the margin for error was pretty big in that situation. <laughs> On the other hand, um, one of uh, we got it right a lot of the time. And uh, uh, Liz, let me read to you something that Liz Perry wrote um, about China watching in those early days. Uh, here it is. pretty darn good considering the limited sources of information we had. The one interesting fly in that ointment, and it didn't turn out to be a fatal fly, was that because the flow of refugees was so limited, there were so few who actually made it from getting across the border and then get, getting the attention of Western scholars at the University Service Center, that a lot of the books that were written from, let's say, the late 60s until the mid-70s, almost until normalization of U.S.-China relations, in that decade, most, I would say, of the scholarly books that were written based on research in Hong Kong were based on interviews with two and only two refugee sources. Uh, one was nicknamed Xiaoyang, and one was nicknamed Laoyang. Uh, little, little Yang and Big Yang. And these two guys between them were hired by a succession of researchers at the, at the University Service Center to provide empirical reference for all the books that were being written. And they were flexible enough to provide references for almost anything you wanted to hear. Uh, because this was their job, this was their employment, giving information, or at least verifying information from foreigners. Talk about reckless uh, research methodology. My Today, that stuff would have been thrown out. Um, and this brings me to the second part of your question. What about compared with today? Training of, academic training of China watchers is far more rigorous and methodologically disciplined today than it ever was then. For one thing, my students are far better linguists than I or most of my contemporaries were. For one thing, we could not go to China. Um, we did not study China as undergraduates, most of us. Uh, I started in my second year of graduate school. Now, most students who you know, are interested in China will take a couple of years as undergraduates, and by the time they're in graduate school, we'll be ready to do a summer intensive course in Beijing or in Shanghai. Uh, none of that was open to us. So already, the language uh, capability is far better. Uh, also, access to China. Uh, starting in about 1980, social science researchers, uh, Western researchers, well, of course, British and Australians could go to China earlier because they had recognized China earlier diplomatically. 
But Americans couldn't go until the early 80s when it was finally possible uh, to do academic research in China using archival materials, interview materials, field research sites, visits. Um, and that opened up an entirely new vista for Chinese studies. Prior to that, we didn't have any uh, access to the, you know, to the micro-societal stuff going on in villages or towns or counties. All we could look at, for the most part, was what's going on in Beijing, who's doing what to whom in the halls of Zhongnan Hai, the, you know, the, uh, the elite residential compound. And so my training and my first several years of China watching were all done at this elite level, trying to figure out, you know, what are the factions, who, who are the conservatives, who are the radicals, what are they doing to each other, what are the big issues uh, involved. And of course, watching Mao's succession crisis unfold in the early 70s. There's a number of stories in my book about that succession crisis that are kind of interesting, but I didn't have time to tell them. Anyway, just one last point on this question. Um, not only was there better language and greater access uh, to field research in China, but also the methodology of Chinese studies has improved enormously. Uh, in my day, area studies was quite separate from, uh, it was not integrated with social science analysis, so that we didn't do uh, statistical training. I had no training as a graduate student in statistical methods, or in formal modeling, or in econometrics. Uh, now, those skills and those techniques are root a routine and important part of graduate training for every uh, grad student in the social sciences. So before you do China research, you really have to know uh, how to do a multi multiple regression analysis uh, uh, on large databases, for example. Since we didn't have any data, we didn't have to worry about databases. Uh, but now they do, and I think now the skill levels and, and what is demanded of, of China research is much more rigorous than it was in those days. David? Uh, a variation on the same theme. Uh, around the time of uh, Tiananmen, there was a lot of on-the-ground observation by both foreign scholars and, and journalists, uh, and there was a more or less uncritical acceptance of the idea that they want to be us, goddess of liberty. As I recall, you were the first person uh, who, a couple of years later, in an article you published in the New York Times about your uh, conversations with Chinese students at University of Beijing mm -hmm. to talk about the new nationalism in China, yeah. an assertive, uh, we want to be us, right. not, uh, not, not them. Uh, why the disconnect? Uh, you know, why, were you, why was there this interval uh, yeah. before the new nationalism was picked up by either scholars or journalists? I think in the, that's a wonderful question, I think in the 1980s, the Chinese were so concerned about lifting themselves out of poverty and about, you know, trying to shake off the heritage of the great of the Cultural Revolution, that horrible experience they had been through. So they weren't looking outward, they were looking inward in the 1980s. After Tiananmen, interestingly enough, you know, Tiananmen in some ways served to, to to um, reorient the young people of China. For one thing, they learned the hard way that resistance to the regime is not the best way to get ahead, to, to say the least. Um, that was one of the bitter lessons of Tiananmen. And then, uh, a year or two after that, Deng Xiaoping offered the young people of China a new opportunity. Uh, get rich, but by the way, don't uh, press your political demands. Uh, channel your energies into getting a career, getting a profession, getting get to the United States to study. Uh, there's an un, there are unlimited prospects for you in that direction, but your prospects, if you're going to you know be a dis dissident, uh, are not so good. Uh, and most China, young Chinese took the uh, uh, took the option that Deng Xiaoping offered them. It was a, a, a bargain they could not uh, afford to refuse for the most part, but. Along with that, in the 1990s, along with this notion that now we can be individuals and we can have aspirations as individuals, came a new pride in country. Uh, the 1990s were a period when China was beginning, just beginning, uh, to feel itself an emerging power in Asia, at least. Not in the world, certainly, not till this decade, but in the 90s you got the sense that Chinese patriotism was being rekindled. Um, and, you know, my first experiences with this were quite vivid. Uh, 
Uh, one, two, first two happened in 1993. One in October of 93, when I was at Peking University, uh, and the uh, China of uh, Beijing was one of the finalists for the 2000 Olympic Games. People forget that. They think 2008 was the first time China was interested. Not. Uh, they applied for the 2000 Olympics and were in the finalist group. And when the award was made in October of, two, of 19, two, nine, sorry, 1993, October of 1993, um, it was the middle of the night because the awards were made in Monaco that year. So in Beijing, it was the middle of the night. And, and the students were in a celebratory mood until the winner was uh, announced, Sydney, Australia. And then the Chinese students began turning notably sour. And some of my own students came up to me and said, why are you Americans always trying to wreck it for us? Always trying to make sure we don't get anything in this world. And I thought to myself, whoa, where did that come from? <laughs> up to that time, I had never encountered on the Chinese street any real noticeable Amer anti-American hostility. But beginning in, 19, uh, also in 1993, there was a famous Yin Hui incident. A Chinese cargo ship was tracked by American intelligence as it went uh, uh, toward the Middle East. And the claim was made by the CIA that this was carrying chemical weapon components. Uh, and uh, the US prevailed upon the Saudi Arabian uh, Navy to board the ship uh, and search it at sea. And when nothing was found, the Chinese were really irate that the United States had, uh, had caused this kind of an incident. Um, and then, a couple months later, I was uh, all still in 1993, uh, I was uh, in the mid -Yang Middle Yangtze River city of Yichang, which is now the, the eastern terminus of the Three Gorges Dam project. Uh, I had been on a cruise at the, in the Three Rivers uh, area, in the, uh, up, in the upper reaches of the Yangtze, through the Three, uh, the, the three Gorges. Um, and I was in the town of Yichang, and uh, it was late afternoon, I was tired, and I decided I wanted to see the town, so I hired a pedicab driver to take me through the town of Yichang. And about 10 minutes into the ride, um, a, a middle-aged Chinese worker you know, t-shirt, dirty t-shirt and work pants, ran out into the middle of the road and jumped in front of my pedicab driver and started <coughs> screaming at him. You shouldn't be pulling the American, the, the foreigner. The foreigner should be pulling you. Um, and I thought, whoa, this is interesting. Um, and the, the poor uh, pedicab driver was really embarrassed by this uh, because he was now being accused of, of uh, aiding and abetting in a, you know, an imperialist uh, uh, Westerner. Um, so finally the guy uh, got out of the way and my pedicab driver continued and he said, uh, I'm going to take you on a shortcut to your hotel. And I thought, uh oh. Uh, and it turns out that he took me to the seediest, most evil looking part of town. And he pointed through a, a, between some buildings to an alley there where some young people, I think unemployed youths, were playing pool. And he said, your hotel is right through there. <laughs> and I thought to myself, no, it isn't. <laughs> but I didn't want him to lose any more face. He had already lost a lot that day. So I thanked him and paid him and, and hired a cab taking, to take me back to the hotel. But these three incidents happening bang, bang, bang like that were the first uh, signs I had had of a building nationalist resurgence in China. Uh, one that had a, had a hostile tinge uh, to America. And of course, later in the 90s, it got worse uh, with the one, uh, the uh, one Ha Li case, with the Cox Commission report about Chinese nuclear theft, uh, with the American bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. I mean, all of these things con contributed to an intensifying atmosphere and feeling, mood, of why do the Americans always want to do us in? Why are they always trying to see that we fail? Um, so I think that, yeah, that was, that, that was characteristic of the 1990s, I think. Yeah, Vincent. Uh, quick question. There's one area China watching has not really made 
that much progress. That's elite decision making and elite it's politics. True. It's true. Can you explain why? <laughs> well, it was crude to begin with, but it's all we had. Yeah. It's still crude, and it's still all we have. Um, until we get access to the minute. Well, occasionally, in retrospect, somebody you know brings out a trove of documents, like the famous Tiananmen Papers which purport to show the inner party you know, discussions that went on in the period up to and including the, uh, uh, the bloody crackdown of June 4th, 1989. But that's very rare. Mostly we have to rely on you know, intuition, on a, on a very vague sense of what the factional alignments are. And making things worse today is the factional cleavages are much more gradual and less ideological and stark and, and less zero-sum conflicts than they were 20 years ago. In, in Mao's day, if you lost, you, you lost. I mean, you really lost. Uh, today, there's a kind of collective decision making where the winners have to pay off the losers, and nobody loses too much in any of these things. The stakes just aren't that high. Uh, and that makes it both less appealing to study it and also less conclusive uh, until, you know, Winston Churchill used to say, that in studying Soviet politics, it was really frustrating because all you see is, all you can hear is uh, dogs growling under a rug. And you can see their shapes under the rug growling. And every so often a bone would fly up from under the rug. And that's the only way you could know what was going on under the rug. Well, I think there's a lot of truth in that in China was as well. Which is one of the reasons why I don't do nearly as much of that elite level analysis now as I used to. It's just A, it's not as much fun, and B, there's much less to work with. Drew? You might have a problem with an invitation of describing the elite in that manner, but uh, uh, I'm, wondering, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm wondering also about the rise of China and its influence on China research. I was just at the University Services Center in Hong Kong a couple of weeks ago. And it's a shell this point for some. Oh, it's not the same. And uh, one of the issues I think that John Dolphin, uh, when he when he recently quit and discussed, who I'm sure was direct when you were there, um, is the issue of self-censorship uh, that is pervasive now in Hong Kong. Yep. Yeah. The loss of far east economic review and other things. And the re reluctance of not just Chinese scholars, but Western scholars in particular, to criticize China and to, uh, to risk uh, the, the power, uh, the weight of Chinese influence to move against them, either from keeping them from coming into the country or from influencing their careers, particularly I think of Chinese graduate students who might want to work in China in the future. Uh, something that I think your generation never had to deal with. Well, we didn't have to deal with it because we couldn't get in. <laughs> um, you know, there was, a, there was a parable that was uh, popular around the time of the Hong Kong handover in 1997. Uh, the parable went, there were two ways uh, to cook a frog. One is you can drop them in boiling water and watch them scream. And the other is you can put them in a pan of lukewarm water and just gently turn up the heat and he'll die with a smile on his face. Um, and that parable was about Hong Kong, was about what the Chinese, were the Chinese going to jump in with their jackboots and the PLA and take over Hong Kong in a really brutal way, which of course didn't happen, uh, or were they just going to turn up the heat ever so slowly while people didn't notice what was going on around them. And I think while that may be a bit of an over-dramatization of what's happened in Hong Kong, I think there is certainly an element of truth in that. Um, institutionally, the Chinese haven't changed anything in Hong Kong. In fact, they're pledged not to for 50 years. Um, but informally, um, in, for example, pressure on newspapers in Hong Kong to print friendly or at least not overly hostile material on, on, uh, about China, advertisers um, have pulled their copy when adverse stories about China have appeared. The big uh, uh, commercial advertisers who need China's goodwill, the banks and the financial houses in Hong Kong, uh, they have sometimes pulled their, uh, their advertising from journals that are a little bit unfriendly to China. Um, and uh, universities, the vice chancellors of universities are often on a very short leash when it comes to tolerating hostile academic research on China. And they have been known to call in faculty who have been a little bit too uh, flamboyant in their, uh, uh, in their criticism of China and uh, uh, talked to them uh, about uh, moderating 
complaints and their, their criticism. Um, so there, around the edges, you have this kind of warming of the, of the, of the, of the pan. But institutionally, there have been no crackdowns. Uh, on paper, it looks like it's the same old Hong Kong. But the atmosphere, to be sure, has gotten a little bit more self-conscious. People sort of look around now before they engage in, in strong criticism of China. Um, so uh, you know, what's going to happen after 50 years? Who knows? I mean, the, the bet was, at that time, in 1997, the bet was that in 50 years, China will have liberalized to the extent that it won't matter uh, because they, you know, their institutions will look more and more like Hong Kong's. So, uh, you know, uh, once they're relieved from their pledge of, of no institutional transformation, it won't be such a traumatic uh, thing 50 years from now. Uh, I still think that that's a good bet, but it's certainly been a rockier road than some people would have forecast. Thank you. Okay, thank you all very much.